the current events. From the housetops, coming up next. Our Quest for Happiness The third enemy which puts obstacles in the way of our happiness is the flesh. By the flesh we mean concupiscence, which, as we have seen, is the tendency of man's lower nature against his higher nature, but more specially the inclination to seek sense pleasures, contrary to the dictates of reason and God's law. The basic passions and tendencies are necessary and good. They come from God. They become sinful only when they are enjoyed in ways which are forbidden by God. When we forget the good purpose God had in placing these tendencies in us and use them solely for the pleasures they afford, we commit sin. For instance, God made food pleasant to the taste and the act of eating enjoyable to man. This is a lawful pleasure, and we are allowed to enjoy it within the reasonable limits of health and physical efficiency. If, however, a person should eat far in excess of the demands of health after hunger had been satisfied and without any other reasonable purpose, he would commit a sin, the sin of gluttony, because he would be making pleasure the supreme goal of his action. This is true also of the other tendencies to sense pleasure. We do wrong if we indulge in them solely for pleasure and without a legitimate reason. We recall that this tendency of our lower nature is a result of the proud rebellion of Adam's will against God, with the consequent loss of the gift of self-control. As we know, God in his great mercy restored to man the possibility of reaching his supernatural goal together with the means of striving for it. God, however, did not will to return to man the gift of perfect control over his own body. He wills that we achieve control over our bodies and their tendencies by the slow process of difficult and often repeated efforts. There are two facts which must be grasped in connection with this striving for self-mastery. One is that self-control is always possible with the help of God's grace. The will may be weakened, but it is still free to resist and reject the invitations to sin which come from our lower nature. Furthermore, God gives the necessary actual graces which enlighten the mind and strengthen the will to refuse consent to sin. The second is that self-control is in harmony with man's nature as God planned it. Many non-Catholic professors and so-called psychologists who believe in naturalism tell us to do everything we feel like doing, to follow all our impulses and enjoy pleasure to the full. They also tell us that to curb and control our passions is unnatural and injurious to health. This is false. We are meant by nature to control our bodies according to reason and God's law. We must mortify our senses if we wish to save our souls. It is true that since the fall, self-control costs us many a struggle and many a sacrifice, but we should always remember that we are acting in a human, reasonable, healthy fashion only in so far as we have the passions under control. When we yield to our passions contrary to reason and God's laws, we are acting not humanly, but like animals. It is noble for man's higher faculties to control and command the body. It is not noble and shameful to allow them to be controlled by the body. It is strong and heroic to withstand the often pressing appeals of passion. It is weak and cowardly to give in. Self-control is the high road to peace and happiness even in this life. Self-indulgence is the sure road to discontentment and unhappiness. To prevent concupiscence from controlling us, we have to control concupiscence. St. Paul writes to the Galatians 5.24, And they who belong to Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. The self-discipline or crucifixion spoken of by St. Paul describes the efforts of the Christian soul struggling to control and govern the body and its tendencies to pleasure. It is the bodily and spiritual exercise or training of the Christian soldier which fits him to combat the enemies of his soul. In this connection we should read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Know you not that they that run in the race all run indeed, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every one that striveth for the mastery refraineth himself from all things, and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. I therefore so run, not as at an uncertainty. I so fight, not as one beating the air. But I chastise my body, and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps, when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. 
This self-discipline may be external, by which we mean the control or custody of our bodies and the senses, or it may be internal, by which we mean the control of mind, will, imagination, and memory. Some of the means which self-discipline makes use of are self-denial in the form of firm and unwavering custody of the senses, fasting, and prayer. The right use of such means supposes the practice of the theological and cardinal virtues, in particular of the virtue of temperance, the virtue of self-control and moderation, and fortitude, the virtue of courage. The mission of Immaculate Heart of Mary School in Still River, Massachusetts, is to preserve the tradition of a solid Catholic education. It has, therefore, a specific duty, that is, the complete Catholic formation of its students. All subjects are taught in the light of the Catholic faith. The teaching of sound, traditional Catholic doctrine leads the student to the development of a true conscience. The goal is for each student to understand the faith and to come to live knowingly as a child of God. The Immaculate Heart of Mary School spans grades 1 through 12. For more information, visit us at www.saintbenedict.com. That's all one word, S-A-I-N-T Benedict. Dot com. Hammond's Meditations on Divine Providence Nothing happens in the universe without God willing or permitting it. He alone rules everything with infinite wisdom, with a strength which nothing can resist, and with a more than paternal goodness to such an extent that not even a hair falls from our head without his permission. To appreciate without reference to providence the events which take place in this world, the events within families, in towns, and in states, in the church, and throughout the whole universe, is to look upon life, look upon the things of this world, as a pagan. In addition to this general providence, God has a special providence which he exercises towards those who love him. He watches over them with particular tenderness and attention, as over his favorite friends, his cherished children, and he shows himself to be rich in goodness and mercy towards them. Thus it follows that not to abandon ourselves with full confidence to his providence is to misunderstand his power, which can do all things, his goodness, which wills all kinds of good on our behalf, his wisdom, whose lights are always infinite, his purposes, which are always most holy, and his means for attaining them, which are always most admirable. Often his reasons are unknown to us, his designs escape our short-sightedness. But what we cannot comprehend here below, we shall understand in heaven. In heaven where we shall praise God, who has done all things well. In the meantime, let us live in a state of abandonment and confidence. This abandonment will be a source of peace and consolation for us. Persuaded that God watches over us, we shall be at rest and looking upon ourselves as beloved children in the arms of the best of fathers, we shall say, Why do I trouble myself? Why do I afflict myself? Even when human means fail, and men are opposed to me, I will rejoice for an opportunity which enables me more perfectly to practice holy abandonment to divine providence, and confidence in its goodness. Even when I may have sinned, I will always have confidence, because God is the father of the repentant prodigal, and has promised pardon to the publican who humbles himself. Thus I ought always to confide in God without being troubled or allowing myself to be cast down. Moreover, God does not wish that our abandonment to his divine providence should be idle. He desires that we should give him our cooperation, our concurrence, that we should be his helps and his arms. In what concerns us personally, he desires that we should do everything which depends upon us, awaiting success, not from our own efforts, but from his goodness, which alone can enable us to succeed. And as regards our neighbor, he desires us to be good, charitable, compassionate, the worthy agents of his love in doing good to men. Happy are those who, entering into these designs of God, endeavor to do their neighbor all the good they can, and to show themselves in everything like to Jesus Christ, full of compassion for human misery, full of kindness towards all to whom they can render any service. They will, at the last day, enjoy the happiness of hearing from the mouth of the judge himself these sweet words, 
Come ye blessed of my Father. I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. Do we thus cooperate with divine providence regarding ourselves or our neighbor? O Almighty and everlasting God, who has granted to thy servants in confessing the true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of majesty to adore the unity, we beseech thee that by the steadfastness and the same faith we may ever be defended against all adversity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Though they were afraid to ask, I think many people would like to know the reasons why some men and women devote themselves to God in religious life. Men and women devote themselves to God to consecrate their whole life in a special way to God, who is infinitely worthy of total love and service. To protect themselves from the corrupting influences of the world which easily lead to sin and to damnation. To atone for past sins and to make salvation the chief object of life. To make reparation for the supreme dishonor offered by so many who, despising God, love and serve themselves and worse, Satan. To make reparation for the sins of the world, especially for those who neglect or refuse the grace of the call to religious life. Men and women devote themselves to God to join the ranks of the church militant, who fight on the front lines for God and for His church. To live the evangelical counsels in imitation of Christ's poverty, chastity, and obedience in the peace and order of a structured life to live in close proximity to the Blessed Sacrament, and to receive the great blessings of daily Mass and frequent reception of the sacraments. And why become a slave of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in particular? All of the above, plus the satisfaction of knowing that by your total consecration to Mary, you join her in the age-old conflict against the serpent that will end with the triumph of her Immaculate Heart and the crushing of his head. For more information about the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, contact SaintBenedict.com. That's S-A-I-N-T, Benedict.com. Pauline from Lumister at St. Anna's Church. I listen to WQPH every day. It's a wonderful station. I hope you all listen in. This is Tom Harvey from the Mass Alliance to Stop Taxpayer Funding of Abortions. The Budget Amendment 759 concerning abortions recently passed the Mass House Representatives and now goes to the State Senate on Tuesday, November 17. I don't think the general public realizes just how radical this bill is. It's for good reason the Democratic leadership postponed the vote on this modified Roe Act bill until after the recent November 3 election. They hope voters will forget about it by the next time uh, election rolls around two years from now. Here are four aspects of this horrible legislation. First, the uh, law that's been on the books for years requires a doctor in a botched abortion to preserve the life of that newborn baby. Uh, This new bill eliminates that requirement. So basically, uh, passive infanticide is allowed. Uh, Second, the law is gonna allow minors to get abortions without their parents' knowledge or even judicial oversight. That's for 16 and 17 year old girls. Uh, Third, um, the bill essentially eliminates any restrictions on late term abortions, those that are 24 weeks or beyond. Fourth, the law on the books for many years in Massachusetts has always required physicians only to, to perform abortions. This new law is gonna lower that standard so that abortions up to 24 weeks, rather up to 23 weeks, can be performed by nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, and physician assistants. In this regard, just how does the lowering of the standard help women? It doesn't. It helps the abortion industry which drafted the bill. Please call your state senator, call the governor, let them know about your opposition to this bill. Thank you. Hi, this is Peter and Jeremy of Your Prayer Intentions reminding you that if you want to get a prayer request to us, there are many ways to do it. You can email us at wqph893 at comcast.net. That's wqph893 at comcast.net. You can tweet us at Radio WQPH. That's Radio WQPH. You can post your prayer request on our prayer wall so that many people can pray for it. That's at wqphradio.org slash prayer wall. Or if you're not a computer person, you can call us 
at 978-343-0893, 978-343-0893. For private prayer intention, simply say or send the word private. And we hope to catch you every Saturday at noon on your prayer intentions right here on WQPH Radio. Goodbye and God bless you all. The greatest, most serious pandemic of all time. No, not the coronavirus. The most devastating plague mankind has ever suffered and that continues to rage to this day is sin. All the physical maladies, every disease suffered by humanity can never approach the consequences of a single mortal sin. For what sufferings of this life, in either intensity or duration, can equal the fires of hell for all eternity? While we're taking great precautions to prevent the spread of communicable disease, it is a perfect time to reflect on the even more urgent necessity of protecting ourselves and our loved ones from sin. It is a doctrine of our holy faith that by Adam, the head of the human race, sin entered the world, and by sin death. Romans chapter 5. The soul, subject to this spiritual death caused by original sin, is restored to supernatural life by sanctifying grace applied to it by baptism. As we journey through life, if we're not careful, the terrible scourge of freely committed personal sin seeps into our souls. Adam's enemy, the serpent, is our enemy to this day. With diabolical persistence, this fallen angel lures his victims to reject God by every imaginable stratagem. He plays on our passions, weakened by the fall of Adam, enticing us to pride, greed, anger, lust, and all the capital sins. He is aided in this battle to gain souls by those in the world who have already, knowingly or unknowingly, placed themselves under his banner. We need to get serious about this real pandemic. Avoid occasions of sin like the plague. If we get infected, go to confession, so that with sincere sorrow for our sins, the sacrament can restore us to spiritual life. How long has it been since your last confession? The frequent use of this sacrament not only cleanses the soul, but strengthens it by building up its immunity to sin. May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most incomprehensible, and ineffable name of God be forever praised, blessed, loved, adored, and glorified, in heaven, on earth, and in the hells, by all the creatures of God, and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. From the Housetops is a Catholic periodical dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Its purpose is to proclaim the faith clearly and without compromise. Each issue of From the Housetops offers the priceless truth and wisdom of the Catholic faith through inspirational lives of the saints and timeless treasures of Catholic doctrine. To get subscription information, back issues, and a free copy, go to saintbenedict.com, S-A-I-N-T, benedict.com, and look for From the Housetops. St. Francis de Sales, the great bishop of Geneva and doctor of the church, who died in 1622, has left in his writings a most valuable treasury of spiritual doctrine. In his meditation on human suffering, he reminds us of the watchful care of divine providence that allows us a participation in the sufferings of Christ. He states, The everlasting God has in his wisdom foreseen from all eternity the cross that he now presents you as a gift from his inmost heart. This cross he now sends you he has considered with his all-knowing eyes, understood with his divine mind, tested with his wise justice, warmed with loving arms, and weighed with his own hands to see that it be not one inch too large and not one ounce too heavy for you. He has blessed it with his holy name, anointed it with his consolation, taken one last glance at you and your courage, and then sent it to you from heaven, a special greeting from God to you, an alms of the all-merciful love of God. How important these truths are in the light of Christ's own words. We cannot be his disciples unless we take up our cross and follow him. In his book, The Introduction to the Devout Life, St. Francis de Sales suggests that when we suffer, we ought to consider our Lord, his passion. He is crucified, forsaken, 
blasphemed, overwhelmed with every kind of injury and sadness, and yet he patiently endures it all for love of us. Consider also, he says, that our sufferings, either in kind or degree, can never even approach all that our Lord endured for us. The voice of the elderly priest praying in Italian is the voice of a saint, Padre Pio. What is most striking about the life of Padre Pio? He is a modern miracle worker, a saint who could biolocate, a mystic who could read souls, see the past and look into the future. Above all these, we recognize a frail man of suffering who bore the very wounds of Christ, the stigmata. These wounds were not, as he said, just decorations. They bled and caused him excruciating pain for all of 50 years. Padre Pio prayed all the time to suffer. He wanted to be like our Lord on the cross, interceding for the salvation of souls. Besides the stigmata, he had trials of misunderstandings, humiliations, and persecution from authorities within the church. He bore all trials patiently, offering them up in union with Christ. The fruits of these sufferings were abundant. By nature, we all avoid suffering as much as possible. We see no use for it. As society becomes more decadent and men more effeminate, the slightest pains, difficulties, and contradictions appear worthless and must be eliminated. Society sees no value in the lifelong struggle of the imperfect child. The sufferings of the old are deemed worthless. Euthanasia is advocated, and even among the healthy, suicide is on the rise. The saints, however, see the value of suffering. Countless men and women gladly gave their life out of love for Christ and received the martyr's crown. St. Peter said, If you partake of the sufferings of Christ, rejoice that when his glory shall be revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4.13 St. Paul loved to recount the many sufferings he underwent in his apostolic journeys, his many labors, imprisonments, beatings, stripes above measure, in deaths often, shipwrecks, stoning, hunger and thirst, and perils from Gentiles and from false brethren. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, he says to the Colossians, and fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh, for his body, which is the church. To the saints, suffering is like gold, a valuable medium of exchange. In the temporal sphere, many are willing to undergo sufferings in exchange for something highly prized. Look at any field of sports and take, for instance, the marathon. In the race and everything leading up to it, are there not long hours of grueling agony? Those who succeed in everyday life are willing to accept the toils and labors related to business, a job, education, or family life. There is suffering wherever we look. In any worthwhile endeavor, success only comes at the price of some sort of suffering. In the spiritual realm, suffering produces its greatest results. Our redemption was purchased at the great price of our Lord's sufferings and death on the cross. This was the culmination of the life of Christ, and it alone is remembered every day in the offering of Mass, the reenactment of Calvary. May we see the value of the sufferings that come our way and pray for the grace to offer them in union with Christ for the love of souls. May Padre Pio give us the example of acceptance of Christ-like suffering. From the House Tops Radio features the same Catholic doctrine, spirituality, church history, and apologetics published for over 40 years in From the House Tops magazine. This program, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, promotes her cause in the age-old conflict with the powers of darkness. From the Housetops on WQPH 89.3 FM. In his book, Secret of Mary, St. Louis de Montfort outlines the necessity of sanctifying ourselves. The faithful soul, he writes, living image of God, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, it is the will of God that you be holy like him in this life and glorious like him in the next. Unless all your thoughts and words and actions all the sufferings and events of your life tend to that end, 
You are resisting God by not doing that for which he has created you and is now preserving you. Oh, what an admirable work to change that which is dust into light, to make pure that which is unclean, holy that which is sinful, to make the creature like its creator, man like God. Admirable work, but difficult in itself and impossible to mere nature. Only God by his grace, by his abundant and extraordinary grace, can accomplish it. Even the creation of the whole world is not so great a masterpiece as this. In a word, you need to find an easy means for obtaining from God the grace necessary to make you holy. And to find this grace of God, you must find Mary. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.